There was a period of time in my life when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with myself. This was kind of, I guess, in my 30s. I was trained as a meditation teacher. I did a lot of visioning. And what I came up with was that I wanted to be a visible public voice for peace and compassion and awareness and justice. Hey, my friends, this is Nishant and welcome to the Nishant Gurk Show. This is a podcast about helping you live a fulfilled life. The mission of the show is to spread mindfulness awareness and my job on the show is to invite world-class experts to extract the practices, routines and habits to help you live a fulfilled and abundant life. This is the 100th episode and I'm so grateful how this mission has come this far and it wouldn't be possible without the support of your dear listeners and all the guests who shared their wisdom on this platform. Today's guest is Diana Winston. Diana is the Director of Mindfulness Education at UCLA Semel Institute's Mindfulness Awareness Research Center. She was called by the LA Times, one of the nation's best-known teachers of mindfulness. She has taught mindfulness since 1999 in a variety of settings, including hospitals, universities, corporations, nonprofits, and schools in the U.S. and Asia. Her work has been mentioned in the New York Times, Newsweek, the Los Angeles Times, and in a variety of magazines, books, and journals. She is considered one of the early founders of meditation programs for youth and taught on the seminal mindfulness and ADHD research study at UCLA in 2005. Diana is a member of the Teachers Council at Spirit Rock Meditation Center in Northern California, where she was trained to teach by Jack Confield. She has been practicing mindfulness meditation since 1989, including a year as a Buddhist nun in Burma. Without further ado, please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Diana. Diana, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. I'm thrilled to talk to you about mindfulness meditation and a lot more things. So while I was understanding and working and doing some homework on your website and what you have done in, in decades, I realized that you were a Buddhist nun in Burma. Can uh-huh. you speak on that, please? Uh, sure. I was... So after about 10 years of doing my meditation practice, I had a teacher who I was practicing with in the United States, and he was a Burmese teacher, and he kept saying, come to, come to, we called it Burma back then, now it's called Myanmar, but come to Burma, come practice, so come practice in my monastery, and I finally was like, yeah, I was able to arrange it with my job and take a year off or take, take time off anyway. I didn't know it was going to be a year at that time. And I flew to Burma and ordained as a Buddhist nun. And what that means was that I shaved my head and wow. I had to wear, <laughs> yeah, every day, every four days I had to shave my head. I had to wear robes. I had to give away my possessions, which I didn't actually do. I just put them into storage. And and I spent the this period of time meditating all day long. And oh, and other rules for being a nun where you couldn't eat after 12 noon. So you had to eat everything before 12. So I lived a life of a, of a Buddhist nun in the monastery in, in the kind of like the for, a forested area, about an hour outside of Rangoon, the capital now called Yangon, mm-hmm. and lived in the and lived and practiced there for that time. What was your reason to becoming a Buddhist nun? Well, I was very devoted to my teacher, and he, I I also had the and he he really wanted me to try it, and he also I also had this idea that if I could practice it in the original fashion that mindfulness was practiced, that I would have that it would be some like really important experience for me which it ended up, I mean, it definitely ended up being in that way. I, and I will say to all your listeners, you absolutely do not have to become a Buddhist monk or nun in order to, <laughs> to um, practice it. But for me at that time, and this was like 20 years ago, there was this really strong draw to this kind of what I felt like the authenticity of how it was practiced and, and to devote my life to my spiritual practice and just like, you know, put everything aside, my career, family, relationships, everything, and just devote thoroughly to my practice was very appealing to me at the time. Mm -hmm. What did you learn from that experience that I would love to ask you, what have you applied? How, how have you applied that experience into your personal life? 
Well, I think that, you know, it, we all have experiences in our lives that are transformational. And I would say that was probably the most transforming experience. So it's it's often even hard to say like, well, exactly came out of it. But I think that, you know, it led to my career in teaching mindfulness and sharing mindfulness. The, the way that I teach mindfulness is very much impacted by what I learned in the monastery. But I, I learned a lot of different things when I was there. One of the things that I learned was to be kinder to myself. <laughs> because when I arrived, I was really gung-ho. And I was on this whole mode of like, you know, I had these ideas, like I was going to reach some kind of enlightened experience, <laughs> right? I was going to get enlightened. And if I just meditated hard enough, I could do that. And so you're on a very rigorous schedule when you're there. As I said, you you don't eat after 12 noon, you're up at around four or five o'clock, you're meditating. And it's pretty much mindfulness meditation all day long, from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed. And even in the, so you're doing like an hour of sitting, an hour of walking, an hour of sitting, an hour of walking, all of these are meditative practices. And then the in-between times, you are supposed to be mindful too. So when you're brushing your teeth, you're mindful. When you're eating, you're mindful. When you're walking from one place to another, you're mindful. So I'm, it's like a, it's like a mindfulness boot camp, right? You're just like <laughs> practicing as hard as you can. And I thought that the harder I practice, the sooner I would get enlightened. And, and I don't even think I knew exactly what enlightenment was. I think it just sounded good. You know, they have a, they have a whole like ideology in the monastery of what it is, which is just, you know, it's their vision of it, which is essentially the uprooting of greed and hatred and confusion from your mind. And so that you have this really pure mind if you reach this certain like state that they want you to reach. But for me, because I was so gung-ho and so this kind of type A, like I wanted to get my A in meditation. And I worked, <laughs> seriously, I worked very, very hard, like trying to meditate longer hours. So people, so you started out an hour alternating hours. And then I was trying to have it be two hours of it and then three hours. And then I would try not to fall asleep at night or I would sleep sitting up and I was trying to reduce my sleep and all of these things, hoping that if I practiced hard enough, I would have some magical moment where my life would change. And what happened instead was I basically pushed myself too hard, you know? So it's like, you can't like, be in a marathon and run a sprint, you know, you have to, you have to pace it over the long term, because I was there for a year. But but I was also when I, I had a really hard time, because I, I just got burned out. And I had to learn. I, I, well, at that point that I got burned out, I don't know how detailed you want me to get to get here. But as I when I got burned out, I went to see my teacher, and I told him that I wanted to leave. And he's like, he basically looked at me. He wasn't the, a nice, warm and fuzzy kind of guy. He was very like hardcore, you know, like work harder. But I said to him that I'm going to leave. I'm going to go to the beaches of Thailand and just relax. And he looked at me and he said, fine, leave. <laughs> but if you do, the afflictions of the mind will always stay with you. Meaning, you know, the, you know, wherever you go, there you are, basically was what he was saying to me. And I was feeling so bad because I felt like what I didn't say is when I burned out, I felt like I had failed. I had come to reach enlightenment and all I'd done was burn myself out. I was having a lot of strong and challenging emotions. I felt like a total failure, especially in this thing that I loved the most. And, and so in that moment of him telling me, if I leave, I'm just going to be who I was anyway, that I realized that I was going to stay, but I was going to stay with a very different attitude. And that's when I decided to practice a lot of loving kindness meditation and compassion meditation and accept myself and not be so goal oriented and so driven because there's an element of this practice that can have a goal, but mm -hmm. there's an element of the practice that's kind of goal less, where it's just full embrace of yourself in the present moment. And as I did that, I started having like a really amazing, extraordinary time, much more fully present and connected and resting in the awareness that was already there without trying to reach some kind of obscure goal. Love it. What's, what was your teacher name? He's passed away now, but he was a very famous Burmese meditation master. So you you mentioned that you were 
practicing loving kindness meditation compassionate and acceptance and the profound thing you just mentioned that meditation or mindfulness is not a sprint it's a marathon do you think <laughs> people consider meditation as something to achieve in life well i think that there are some people who can who view meditation like ex- an extreme sub- sport you know i was one of those people <laughs> like most people these days are not doing what i do i mean there are some people there's a there's a whole a number of people many 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 people i know who do go travel to live in monasteries or there's actually wonderful places in the united states to practice and in europe and all over to practice without having to go into the forest jungle of burma but that being said there are people who a lot of mindfulness these days seems to be more about stress reduction helping us to feel better having you know working with difficult emotions and <clears throat> these are very worthy goals but it's kind of like a different stream of the people who do the like extreme sport version of it so people are trying to reduce their stress and that is why they go towards mindfulness so diana so i would like to ask you what is real mindfulness according to you I define mindfulness as paying attention to our present moment experiences with openness, curiosity and a willingness to be with that experience. So that's the definition I use. I mean oftentimes people are lost in the past or lost in the mm-hmm. future and you probably know that very, <laughs> very well. Anyone who practices does and what we learn to do through mindfulness is not is come back into this moment and to train our mind to repetitively return again and again and then that becomes more of our default setting instead of being lost in our anxiety and depression which tends to live in the past or the future going a few years back la times called you one of the best known teachers of mindfulness that is wow what different were you doing at that point in the mindfulness <laughs> space well i've been in it a very long time let's put it that way so i think that i don't know if it's what they said is true or not but <laughs> i have been you know i started meditating right after college so i was about 21 22 and then it's been the next 30 years doing this so i've been in the space for a very long time i was initially in the buddhist world but there was a point in my life where i was teaching i was trained to teach as a buddhist teacher but i realized that the skills and tools that i had to teach could benefit people regardless of their background regardless of their religion and so that's when i started working with ucla to teach mindfulness more widely and so now in the last 15 years i've been in los angeles teaching through our mindful awareness research center at ucla in the hopes of making these practices available to people from different backgrounds and communities and i think that i would say that's sort of why they might have called me that because i've been a pioneer in the field of mindfulness and training teachers mm-hmm. bringing it into all sorts of different programs and bringing pro- throughout the world you are very kind diana <laughs> so i'm i'm curious to ask you that what advice would you give to a 21 year old college student in terms of meditation what advice would i give to a 21 year old college student well it's interesting we teach a class at ucla for undergrads we teach a number of different classes we teach our classes at ucla are for both both the general public and also for the students and it's the class that this is not really what you're asking but the classes are really popular with the students because they're really learning life skills and i think that i would say that to keep in mind it's a long journey that it that it can be something that they can use for life and i feel so grateful that i learned this practice when i was a young person because it's been the foundation of how i understand and make sense of the world and so to get started at a young, at a younger age is awesome a lot of people don't get to mindfulness until they're in their 40s and 50s and 60s and so on so so i would say to listen to your heart and if you feel drawn like really follow pay good attention inside one of the things i really hate is people giving away their power to some guru or some teacher without really 
like forgetting how to listen to ourselves. So I say that a lot to young people to find, to just be really attuned to yourself and listen and then, you know, seek support because we don't know the answers to things sometimes, but, but also trust that we do have the answers inside ourselves in some way. I think that's something that also I learned when I was in the monastery, like the thing that I was seeking was just inside me in a way. And it took me like, you know, traveling to a foreign country, ordaining as a Buddhist nun, living under very harsh circumstances with heat and bugs and snakes and spiders and scorpions and all sorts of things that happened when I was there and feeling bad about myself. And that feeling bad about myself motivated me to practice harder. But when I learned that who I was as I was, was okay, that was when I could relax. And so I would say that to young people today, like, yeah, like you are already fine. You are not deficient. You are not your anxiety. You're not your fear. You're not your grief. You're not your anger. You're so much more profound than that. And to really trust that and learn these skills and tools because these skills and tools will help you access the deeper wisdom that's already there within you. I read about you that you mindfully parent your younger daughter. Can you speak on that, please? Sure. I Well, <laughs> I think the operative word might be try <laughs> to mindfully parent my daughter. I have an, I have an 11-year-old, and you know, I try to bring it into my parenting in all sorts of ways. I try to bring it to when I have strong emotions so that I don't act out. You know, she does something that pisses me off and I don't immediately like yell at her, but I take a moment to pause and notice my body and notice my emotions and come back to center so that I can act with more, uh, with more, you know, kindness and less reactivity. I bring my mindfulness practice to her when she's in her difficult emotions because, you know, she's still little. So it's hard. I don't, to, there's no way I would ever force mindfulness on a child ever, <laughs> especially my kid who thinks that mindfulness is stupid. But hey. oh yeah, I mean that's not completely true. She actually likes to do meditation at night when she's trying to fall asleep. So I will give her that. But but she does like to make fun of it too. So so I'm I I'm also able to be mindful with her when she's going through difficult emotions. So when she's having a really hard time and she, or she's very upset about something, I try to practice mindfulness with her and, and like hold her in my own, in my mindfulness, such as she's upset. I'm not trying to like tell her there's something wrong with her or try to fix it immediately or solve it or tell her to stop feeling the way she's feeling. But I just hold her in a space of kind acceptance and, and awareness. And so I practice that as much as I can. And then I, I practice, I practice a lot of looking at my expectations of who I think she's supposed to be and being really mindful of that and letting her be herself. I think that's one of the things that parents struggle with a lot is like you want your kid to either be, you know, a specific thing you've imagined or in your image and they're really themselves. And so one of my big mindfulness practices is learning to relax and let her be who she is and really trust that. That is interesting. So can I ask you, what's your expectation unconsciously with her? <laughs> Oh, you know, things I, I want her to like the things that I like. Like, for instance, I'm a really huge reader. And my daughter likes reading, but she's n not to the degree that I do. And so I'm, how come she's not reading more? I want her to read more, right? So like, like those kinds of stories that we carry with ourselves or even a, a long time ago, it was funny because she didn't like the book Harry Potter. And I was like, What? How could, how could you not like Harry Potter? How could anyone not like Harry Potter? And I was horrified. You didn't like it? No. Ah, okay, all right. Well, there you go. There are a few of you out there. But it's just a funny example of like these stories we create. Like I'm supposed to have a child who likes Harry Potter because I like Harry Potter. Well, the truth is actually many years later, she did read Harry Potter and she really liked it. But I gave it to her when she was too young, probably because I was like too excited. But managing those expectations about who we want the child to be. That's really important. So those, those are just like some kind of like simple examples, but you know, 
I want her to do perform a certain way in school or how come she like, you know, I tried to teach her a musical instrument. I mean, not I get, got her lessons for musical instrument and she wasn't interested. What? I thought she was supposed to be really musical. You know, I mean, whatever these stories that all these, all parents carry. And then we have to see it and laugh at ourselves and say, okay, let them be who they are. It's so important. Diana, you have been practicing mindfulness for a long time. So you have this natural awareness to deal with your daughter. If somebody doesn't have this kind of awareness, what should they do? Well, you will cultivate it. Like it's, it's definitely something that anybody can develop if they're interested and they put in the time. So having a regular meditation practice is really important because that's kind of like the through line that keeps you connected to yourself and, 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 no, and helps you build the skill. So a regular practice, even if it's not every single day, and it, I always start people off with just five minutes and then if that is going well, then we move up to 10, 15, like 15 minutes is a good amount of time, 15 to 20. And so having a daily practice so that when you're in a jam with your kid, you have that to draw on. And we, we usually make the distinguish, we distinguish between formal and informal practice. So formal practice is when you deliberately sit down to meditate. Informal practice is when you apply it throughout the day. So that's the next thing, if you're just starting out, you can still bring mindfulness to any moment. You can bring mindfulness to when you're about to yell at your kid, you can pause and take a breath. You can, you notice that you're frustrated because they didn't get the grade you wanted or whatever. You can notice, you can manage your own frustration in the moment. I like to teach parents to stop and stop stands for stop. Not parents. I like to teach everybody. This is a helpful acronym. <laughs> Stop, take a breath, observe, and proceed. And it's just when you're feeling the need for mindfulness, you can just stop, take a breath, and then with your eyes open or closed. And in fact, anyone who's listening can do it right now. We're just stopping, we we'll take a breath. And then observe what's happening inside me right now. Okay, my stomach is clenched, my heart is racing, my jaw is tight, or maybe for those of you who are listening, you're just noticing that you're curious, you're hearing my voice, you're noticing some relaxation in your body. Anything that's happening in the moment can be observed. And then P, proceed, and proceed means just move on in life, but you do so with more awareness because you've taken this time to stop. And so using that little intervention in the midst of your day for parents or anyone else can be really helpful. And you talk about these practices in your book, Fully Present. There are essential components of breath and awareness. Yeah. So Fully Present is the one where I co-wrote with a scientist. And that one has a lot of um, the research behind mindfulness. And I write the part about the, like the practice and how to do it and the, all of the theory behind it. And so this book gives you a lot of tools for working with mindfulness, for working with difficult emotions, physical pain, cultivating positive emotions, for just bringing, reducing stress, creating more embodiment. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that mindfulness, that that book teaches you how to bring mindfulness into your life. I would like to ask you this personal question. How do you cultivate positive emotions and joy in your life? Well, you're asking it personally or you're asking it like, because there's you're, like specific practices. <laughs> okay. Both in your um, life. Yeah, I mean, I do these practices, these positive emotions practice. So one practice we call loving kindness practice, where you repeat phrases and send kindness out to people and to yourself. So that's one thing I do on a regular basis. But the things that I do that provide joy hanging out with my daughter is a lot of fun, even even in this this time of the pandemic, where we're really, you know, together all the time, <laughs> like everybody is. But just just hanging out and being playful and playing games and relaxing and we like to cook together. We both really, really enjoy cooking and we both enjoy watching cooking shows and trying to make things we saw in the cooking shows. 
for me, reading, I mentioned I love. I love to be out in nature. That gives me a lot of joy. And there's been a reduction of that in the past number of months, of course. But but I feel like my life, and I love my work. You know, I feel very grateful that the work that I do is consistently bringing me joy, although there are parts of it that I don't like. But. <laughs> <laughs> what are you reading these days? What am I reading these days? Okay, I just finished this very strange book called Lady in Waiting, I think, about, um, I like fiction. So I was, re- this one actually is, that not is fiction. interesting. That's not fiction. It's nonfiction. It's a book on the life of the, the person who was the lady in waiting to Princess Margaret. And it's just like the story of the aristocracy. And it's very strange. But I also am reading, I'm looking forward to reading the book Cast that just came out by Isabel Wilkerson. I have that like queued up to read. I'm very interested in a lot of the 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 reading around issues of race and race types of issues right now are really really meaningful to me. And then for fiction, I have fun. what did I read recently? Oh, you know what I've been reading? <laughs> I've been reading Holocaust literature. <laughs> and the reason I've been reading that is because it is what people were experiencing who were in in the holocaust is so much more severe than what we are going through in this time of quote unquote hardship and it helps me to feel a lot of gratitude and appreciation for and also to hear these incredible stories of how people persevered or were in the resistance movements during the time of nazi germany yeah do you have a formal meditation practice now i do yes could you speak on that what does your meditation practice look like now so ever since i had my child it impacted my meditation practice so i used to have a lot more time for for long extended periods of practice and also for going away on retreats which was very important to me and i was able to you know after the year i spent in the monastery i probably have spent many many months each year well probably like a month a year after that practicing and months before that but but in these days having a child i only get like one retreat a year for maybe 7 days if i'm lucky and then my daily practice is i get up and then i walk my dog and i walk the dog as a mindfulness practice and i'm very deliberate about that that i mean i don't always do it cuz sometimes i'm like too sleepy and don't want to do it but but i make i i i really bring my awareness into my walking into the pausing i stop a lot of course when you're walking the dog and feeling my feet on the ground so i do that as the first part and then i come inside and i go into a room and i i do i meditate for i don't know i don't have a huge amount of time so around 20 minutes or so and maybe do a little journaling too afterwards and sometimes i i meditate in bed so before the dog gets me i might do it then and then i practice mindfulness throughout my day as i was describing so you were saying that you you spent 20 minutes in your meditation practice and after that you do some journaling do you have a journaling prompts or is it a free flow more just free flow and i don't do it every every time i meditate but sometimes you know it de- it depends if i'm like if there are particular issues that are i'm wanting to go in deeper in a more analytical and way i might use journaling for that a lot of my guests on this podcast have mentioned about free flow journaling and different ways to journal i would love to ask you how can we cultivate this art of journaling to really release our attachments to letting go of you know anything that that is holding on to our life i don't i may be not the best person for to answer this question because i'm i just write whatever i feel like like i don't have any specific practice around it i just see what what wants to come out you know what i mean so maybe other people there answer it in other ways so are you saying that whatever you have in your mind you just put it on a piece of paper no it's not even that specific so let's say i i meditate let's say there's a topic that i'm thinking about and i just want to make sure that i think about it more thoroughly then i might journal about it and just see what comes up almost i don't know if it's coming from my subconscious or whatever but just like making space for for 
uh, see, I don't want to do that in meditation because then I would just sit there thinking about the thing. Mm. So that's why I separate it <laughs> out. Like, okay, I want to just reflect a little bit on this topic. So it's very informal. Just it's something I've done off and on pretty much my whole life. You actually gave a very good point that this can be very intentional. You know, you have a topic in your mind and you can literally go deeper into that topic through journaling because when in meditation when we are thinking we just keep thinking of our mind keeps wandering here and there yeah and we don't want to do that <laughs> <laughs> so in one of your blogs i found that you talk about kung fu dharma what is that <laughs> you really dug deep into the internet <laughs> I I wrote a story a really long time ago. I think about, 2007. Yeah, okay. Nice. So that feels like a long time ago to me where I was I got challenged by my by someone to to get stronger in my body and I started taking kung fu classes and I did it at the UCLA gym. So I was the only like person over 25 in the whole room <laughs> and it was and i it was very hard and and like scary for me to to punch but i used my mindfulness practice to learn how to <clears throat> be present with that and it was extremely helpful in the end because it really really just brought in a kind of embodiment and a fierceness that i think i was protecting myself from so I did that for a while and then I got pregnant and then I had to stop, of course. You stopped Kung Fu. Yes. <laughs> so in this conversation, we have talked about your reading habits. So I would love to ask you, what kind of books have, have you gifted the most in your life? Or what books have you gifted the most? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I may not have anything off the top of my head. I can tell you the book that I'm gifting right now is called A Bigger Sky, Awakening a Fierce Feminine Buddhism. And it's written by this very close friend of mine, Pamela Weiss. And it's about her journey as a Zen student and to a more kind of going from like sort of the masculine paradigm into a feminine paradigm of awakening. And it's a beautiful book. So I've been really happy to share that with friends lately. Yeah, that seems a great book. And I will put that link into the show notes. Nice. That's great. And uh, I'm curious to ask you, what are some of the things that you have changed your mind about in the last few years? Hmm. <laughs> You're asking now the hard questions. <laughs> hmm. Well, I never expected to be a pet owner and now I am, and I think it's the best thing ever. I, I think I didn't realize how much it was going to upend my life. Like I had, like I had my routines, I would get up, I would meditate. Now I get up and I have to walk the dog. So it's kind of forced me to put another being other than, I mean, obviously my daughter is very, this is hugely relevant here, but having this third being who takes center stage and I wouldn't say exactly it changed my mind but changed my life a lot but I have to think more about your question I don't have anything that's coming to me right away mm -hmm. do you think meditation can help in finding more happiness in our life I absolutely think meditation can help us find more happiness I know this from working with literally thousands and thousands of people over many years who have told me how doing the mindfulness practice has brought more happiness, more ease, more well-being, countless stories of individuals who have said that their lives have changed through the practice and their, their, their spouses don't recognize them because they're kinder, more compassionate, or they listen better, or people whose health has improved. I know for myself that... I, you know, it's always hard to speculate what would I be like if I hadn't done this because I've done it so much of my life. But I, I think that it is the primary source of happiness in my life because what I'm doing is working with, like, like in life, we there are all these conditions that happen that we don't have control over. So we don't have control over the pandemic or the climate issues or, you know, the there, there's whatever's ha happening for us due to the pandemic, like economic issues and so forth, we don't have control. But what we do have control over is our relationship to the experience. And so we can meet the difficulties in life with resistance and blame and 
feeling like a victim, or we can meet the difficulties in life with with kindness for ourselves and others, for with balance, for the even mindedness, with humor, with perspective. And this is what leads to happiness, like true happiness. True happiness is not getting like another car or something. True happiness is it's an inside job. So absolutely this practice leads to tremendous happiness in my experience and with others. Yeah, that's a beautiful way of putting it out. If finding happiness, inner wisdom, enlightenment, is that we know the path, we know that mindfulness meditation is one of the many paths to get there towards inner wisdom, enlightenment, then why do you think people find challenge in doing all these basic practices? Yeah, because they're not easy. <laughs> they take all the things that people struggle with, discipline, energy. Um, <laughs> they can be discouraging. It can feel like nothing's happening. You know, it's, it's. I mean, you know, like trying to get to the gym, you know, it's a good idea. You try it. People do it for a little while. They give up eating well. They start eating well for a while, then they find it hard. And, and, and that's just the nature of things. Like it just hard things can transform us, but they take time and energy and persistence and diligence. And they take our, the, the most important thing though, is an attitude of kindness that we can bring to ourselves. So, okay, I knew I planned to meditate today, but I didn't, I'm not going to beat myself up. I'm going to be really kind to myself and just start again tomorrow. Okay, I was meditating today, my mind was wandering, I was thinking about 100 things, I think I noticed one moment of my breath, but I'm going to be really loving to myself and just know that every breath counts. And so that's, a, that's the approach I take. Yeah, and it's a practice as long as we continue to do this practice, we are good at it once we stop doing it, you know, it just goes away, it's like any other habit in life. That's right, yes. If somebody wants to becoming a mindfulness instructor, facilitator, or teacher, or any name, we say, mm -hmm. what, what is the path to becoming that teacher? So the most absolute important thing is that you have your own practice. So this is, and that you have spent some time and are serious about it. So that means like, for instance, the teacher training program that I run requires that you've had a couple of silent meditation retreats and um, have had at least four years of practice. But but what we don't want, I mean, unlike, like you can teach history without having lived through history, you can't teach mindfulness without having you know, practiced it. So the embodiment of mindfulness is the number one thing. And then, and then after that, it's uh, getting good training. And, and then also having a vision, I'll say more about the training, but having a vision, like, who do you feel drawn to teach? Not just, oh, I just want to be a mindfulness teacher, but, oh, I've, um, like, who, where, how, like, being specific is helpful. But training is important. And so, do, for that reason, I've been part of an effort for a number of years called the International Mindfulness Teachers Association. And what that is, it's a membership and accrediting organization that accredits teacher training programs, and it accredits individual and credentials, individuals who've gone through those programs. So you can get a certified mindfulness teacher or professional level degree uh, credential. And the reason that we have this is that Right now, until we existed, pretty much anybody could say they were a mindfulness teacher. So they didn't have to have those things I mentioned, that embodiment and that deep practice and no training. Like you could take a mindfulness course for three days and then say you're a mindfulness teacher. And that's just ridiculous. So the IMTA, the International Mindfulness Teachers Association, is helping to build professionalization, standardization, ethics, and so forth into the field. So that's a really important initiative that I'm part of. That's a great distinction because a lot of people can meditate, but how do you teach this mindfulness to others? Could be different. You need training. You absolutely need training for sure. You know, embodiment, I can embody meditation. I can do it every day, but how should I teach? To <laughs> I need to do some professional training. You can come join my training at UCLA. <laughs> <laughs> I would love it. I would love it. And, uh, you also teach mindfulness in the hospitals. So what, what are the practices that you teach in the hospitals? 
Okay, so just to say, I teach mindfulness in a variety of settings. In fact, at this point, pretty much most any setting. So hospital, but we are located in the medical school at UCLA in the psychiatry department, and so we we do a lot of interface with the with the UCLA health system as well as you know all everything we do through our, my center is open to the public now, especially now that it's virtual. But one of the things we have is we have all these free meditations and now they're on the iPads that are on every room in the hospital. So people who are in the hospital can listen to mindfulness recordings whenever they want. A lot of what I do is I train hospital professionals so that they can bring it into their setting. So I know there are people working in, you know, in different, many different hospital systems throughout the country and the world who have, who have been trained who by us in mindfulness. So there's lots of things. And, and honestly, mindfulness, what I would teach them in the hospital, I would emphasize working with physical pain, but I would um, probably teach the same thing as someone who's teaching mindfulness, like learning about mindfulness and they're an educator or they're a mental health professional or they're a, in a corporate setting because the same practices translate and then they have different variations. You know. Yeah, the same practice can really be translated to any other setting. That is a great point. So you have mentioned physical pain a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Was there any point or instance in your life when you dealt with physical pain through mindfulness? In your life, in your personal yeah, life. I mean, I yes, I have, but I know that there are many people who have had done way more than I have, who've had much more to deal with. But I could answer what I could answer is what? How do you use mindfulness for working with physical pain? If you want, yeah, let's do it. So the main thing that we teach people when working with physical pain is to a couple of different things. One is to find a part of your body or something outside your body that is not in pain and bringing your attention into the physical pain to notice that the physical pain is not always what's the word it's not it's not necessarily continuous it's not it, it's a set of changing sensations that are potentially interesting and worth observing so that we can notice when you're feeling, oh no, let's say I hurt my leg and it's in so much pain. We can notice that it's made up of burning and stabbing and tingling, that it's moving, that it's increasing, that it's decreasing. So we start to give people that mindfulness approach to the pain. And, and then, but as I started to say, not overwhelm it, like you don't stay with the pain. You also go to, let's say your feet feel relaxed So you notice your feet and then you go back to the physical pain. So this, this movement back and forth. And then the third thing is, there are th four things actually, but the third thing is that we separate out our stories about the pain from the pain itself so that you may be having a physical, actual physical pain, and then you have all these stories running. Oh no, what happened to me? Poor me, something's wrong. This is bad. It's only going to get worse. What if it never goes away? And so we really encourage people to notice those as stories and just stay with a direct experience and not get lost in those stories. And then finally, uh, bringing kindness to ourselves when we're in pain is absolutely crucial. We human beings create stories about everything in our life. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, Diana, so since we have limited time, and uh, before I ask you my last question, I would love to ask you, what is the impact you want to leave on this world? Oh, that's a sweet question. There was a, a period of time in my life when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with myself. This was kind of, I guess, in my 30s, and I was really, I was trained as a meditator teacher, but it, I, I, you know, I told you I was in this Buddhist world. And anyway, I, 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 I did a lot of visioning. And what I came up with was that I wanted to be a visible public voice for peace and compassion, awareness, and justice in the larger public domain. And that's the impact that I hope I'm having and hope I will continue to have in this world so that others can have access to these beautiful tools to help them find more inner peace and more connection to themselves and more wisdom and more self-love and compassion. So 
in the ser- in the service of the world waking up. So it's not just us. It like when it in- when we get affected by our practice, we impact our relationships and we impact our jobs and our communities and the institutions we're part of, and it just ripples out through the world. Yes, Diana, you are very much visible in the public eye. <laughs> no, and, it wasn't at the time when I thought of that. <laughs> you were, you have been for no. decades. Hmm. And my last, but last, but not the least question is, where can our listeners find more about you? Okay, so, so much of what I do is, is, at, is our UCLA Mindful Awareness Research Center, which is uclahealth.org slash Mark, M-A-R-C, for Mindful Awareness Research Center. I have my own website, dianawinston.com. Evidently, I'm on Twitter, but I only tweet like once every <laughs> two months or something. So I've that's that. not a great place to find me. I, I have a new book out called The Little Book of Being, which is available in every, whatever, all over. And that, that talks about a, lo- a lot about practices of recognizing the awareness that's already present within us. So it's, it's just a slightly different approach to basic mindfulness practice. But I think that your listeners might enjoy that. And then I'm on different, different what's it called, different apps. So we have the UCLA Mindful app. I'm part of 10% Happier. And I'm going to be, so those are the two best places to find me. Right are now. you part of Calm app as well? I'm not part of Calm, no. I am part of a little bit. I'm going to be doing some stuff for the Waking Up app, with Sam Harris, mm. coming up. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll put all this information in the show notes. Great. That is great, Diana. That was amazing, mindful, kind, loving, compassionate conversation with you. I really enjoyed that. Oh, well, thank you for your great questions. That helps, <laughs> helps me answer a lot. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for listening to this podcast episode today. If you did enjoy this, please subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or you can visit https colon slash slash nishangarg.me n-i-s-h-a-n-t-g-a-r-g dot me you can also share this episode with your loved ones to help them live a fulfilled life you are not alone in this journey we all struggle in life there is no shame in talking about it i go through my highs and lows i get depressed and these practices help me in living a resilient life you can also do this you got this don't judge yourself you are doing the best you can and thank you so much again thank you